My next guest is a longtime political strategist, former advisor to Donald Trump and a best-selling author. Last year, he got arrested, charged, and convicted, he says, for the crime of supporting the president. But earlier this month, President Trump commuted the sentence of Roger Stone, just days before he was scheduled to report to prison. He's here tonight for his first in-studio interview since his commutation. Please welcome my friend, Roger Stone. Roger, good to have you here. Thank you, Governor. You know, you went through a period where you didn't have a whole lot of friends. All those people kind of abandoned you, didn't they? No, it's amazing how the country club Republicans and the establishment types who pretended for so many years to yep. be my friends, how they cut and run, how they headed to the tall grass. In fact, I want to thank you, Governor, because you're one of the few who stood tall from the very beginning. You called out the injustice I was being subjected to. You were among a handful of folks who pointed out how completely political the prosecution of Roger Stone was and how this was really a persecution, not a prosecution. Well, it was, it was maddening to me because I saw not just uh, the attempt to go after you, that was clear, but the manner in which it was done, the raid at five o'clock in the morning on your home with uh, 27 SWAT cars and uh, automatic weapons. I mean, they could have simply called your lawyer and said, look, can you bring Roger in at nine o'clock this morning to the courthouse? We, we need to, uh, you know, file the charges. Yeah, and you would have done it. Yeah, that's the irony of this. The Democrats argue that I somehow received special treatment. Let's oh yeah, go, you did. Let's go through <laughs> that. When 29 SWAT clad uh, uh, assault weaponing FBI agents arrive at your home in 17 armored vehicles with a helicopter overhead, I lived on a canal then, two amphibious units pull up to the dock behind my house, frogmen with, with rifles jump out. They surround your home. They bring a battering ram up to the front door like they're gonna break it in. They've got dogs, a canine you know, unit on leashes, and they start pounding on the door. For the first time, nonviolent, white collar crime, process crime of lying to Congress, yeah, that's special treatment, no question about it. Well, and, and the fact that CNN just happened to be in the neighborhood we know that didn't happen. Yeah, actually, by looking at the security camera footage after the fact, we know that CNN showed up exactly 14 minutes before the FBI. In other words, it was the shortest stakeout in American journalistic history. <laughs> and, and I don't know of anybody in America other than CNN who believes that they were just that good at what they do, because we all know they're not that good at what they do. Um, one of the reasons the president commuted your sentence, you were about to be sent to prison. Um, you have some health issues. You're in that age group over the age of 65. It would have potentially been a death sentence. They were letting people out of prison who committed violent crimes so that they wouldn't get coronavirus. And they were about, you to, about to send you into it. Yeah, it's more of the special treatment. So actually, the legal precedent in the United States, everybody in my situation who was either uh, convicted of a nonviolent crime and about to go to prison or convicted of a nonviolent crime and was in prison was transferred to home confinement. Michael Avenatti, the Democratic super no. lawyer, uh, the former Trump lawyer, Michael Cohen, who, uh, who was uh, uh, transferred out and then violated predation laws and they still left him out. Or even Rick Gates, uh, the Manafort bag man who testified against me. Very strong guy because those bags were very heavy, you know. <laughs> uh, but, but contrary to the precedent, in every circuit in the United States, including D.C., contrary to the current uh, regulations of the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons, contrary to my current age and health, and contrary to the facts regarding COVID-19 in the prison in Georgia that where they wanted to send to me, they were insisting that I turn myself in two Tuesdays ago. At the same time, the prison they wanted to send me to released a child pornographer, a serial rapist, uh, a, 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 an armed bank robber, uh, and, a, a, and a pedophile. They, they were coming out of prison at the same time they wanted to put me in. And they were coming out because they wanted to protect them from the virus. Yes, exactly. But they were ready to send you in. You're right, Roger, that's special treatment for sure. You have to. It's like when Abraham Lincoln, after having been run out of town on the rail, once said, if it weren't for the honor of it, I'd just soon pass. Exactly. No, I think the idea here is very clear. Um, if I had died in prison, which I really think was the plan, then my appeal would never get to court. And when my appeal gets to court, 
the mother crowd, the dirty cops, the prosecutors, the, the corrupt jury, the corrupt jury forewoman, and the judge herself will all be exposed. That's something they can't afford. So that's why they were hell-bent on sending me to prison where my life would have clearly been in danger. I mean, I'm 67 years old. I know I don't look it. <clears throat> but uh, No, you don't. I, I, I've, had, I've had a lifetime struggle with asthma. I almost died of it of, as an infant. So um, we, we submitted under seal substantial uh, uh, medical records that proved I would really be at risk. They didn't care. And here's the worst part. Not only did my trial judge rule against us, we then appealed that to a three-judge circuit appeal, mm -hmm. and we lost that 20 minutes before the president commuted my sentence. So I would have been in prison, uh, and I think at risk of my life, two weeks ago. How did you find out that your sentence had been commuted? And just by the fact, our audience needs to know, a commutation is not a pardon. There's Correct. a difference. Commutation means that you have been commuted for the serving of the time. Correct. But you still stand convicted. So that's something, a whole new battle you have to fight, but you won't have to fight it from a prison cell. Well, the, how did you find out that the, you had been commuted? The advantage, of course, is that when you accept a pardon, for example, as former President Nixon did for yeah. President Gerald Ford, you are accepting guilt. You're acknowledging guilt. In a commutation, I still argue that I am innocent and I'm still going to pursue my appeal. Now, should my conviction be overturned, which I think it will, given the egregious misconduct of the juror forewoman, who was secretly attacking both me and the president on Twitter and Facebook in 2019, the year before my trial, had those posts on a private setting during jury selection and the trial, and then deleted them afterwards, the judge said that was not evidence of bias, of yeah. course it was, I would still have to go to trial in front of the same judge. Uh -huh. So my lawyers want me to think long and hard about that, but as of today, I intend to file the appeal, uh, to, to pursue the appeal. Uh, and, I, and the president called me uh, at about seven o'clock the Friday before I was supposed to turn myself in. He was very gracious, he was very warm. Of course, we've been friends for 40 years. He knows uh, that they put me under enormous pressure to lie, to bear false witness against him. They had identified a number of phone calls between myself and candidate Trump in 2016, and they wanted me to come clean. They wanted me to confess. They wanted me to cooperate in return for some vague promise of leniency. I knew what they were doing. This was days before the Mueller report. They had no Russian collusion. They wanted me to be the ham in their ham sandwich, and I declined. I refused to lie. Today, they tried to flip that around and say, oh, Stone maintained his silence about misconduct by the president in return for clemency. That is absolutely false. There is no evidence to support that, but that's what all the House Democrats were saying today when they ganged up on Attorney General Barr. Well, I was gonna bring that up because uh, they tried to make it as if there was some special secret deal between you and the president. What they actually convicted you of, lying to Congress, what is the essence of what they have said? And you know, I, I know you've talked about the juror and the judge. Um, obvious question, why didn't your lawyer try to fight having that person on the jury. Did you know in advance uh, we that didn't, that person? We didn't know because, first of all, we had used all of our strikes. Okay. Secondarily, the judge has already held that Democratic Party activism, hatred of Donald Trump, those would not eliminate you from the jury. Mm. In fact, I had a jury of 12 Democrats. Mm. No independents, no Republicans, no military veterans, no conservatives, no evangelical Christians. Yet it's supposed to be a jury of your peers. It clearly was not your peers. Well, it was certainly, it may have been ethnically diverse, but it was not ideologically or politically diverse. Okay. Let me put it to you another way. It could have been the Obama-Clinton administration alumni reunion. <laughs> I mean, uh, the yeah. a majority of the jurors had either worked as political appointees, not yeah. civil servants, as political appointees in either the Obama or Clinton administration, or they worked in a left-wing think tank, or they worked for a political action committee. A couple of them worked for uh, uh, early Democratic opponents for the president. There were, there were no sympathetic jurors. Yeah. Uh, it is almost mathematically impossible to pull a pool of 120 initial jurors. There was one Republican. The government knocked them out in the first round. You know, when you were uh, on our show, it was remote, but we talked at that time, and, and you made a powerful uh, revelation that as all of this has been piling in on top of you, it has also given you a, a new, renewed sense of your own spiritual life. And I know some people will be cynics and they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, Roger, he, you know, gets threatened with jail, so he has a jailhouse conversion. Uh, but it wasn't that. It was a deeply profound 
moment in which you recognize uh, God's presence in your life. And I can't end this without having you share with us that part of Roger Stone that most people probably don't know. And heck, a year ago, you didn't know that part of well, Roger it, Stone. It's absolutely true. I mean, first of all, you cannot understand how horrific it is to be targeted by a vengeful federal prosecutor with a political agenda. They destroyed me financially. I lost my home, my savings, my insurance, my ability to make a living, my voice, because I was unconstitutionally gagged, so I couldn't write or speak or defend myself. And um, I would say last January, I pretty much hit rock bottom. Yeah. I was angry, I was frustrated, I was broke. I was worried about my wife because she's 73, uh, she is hearing impaired and she has rheumatoid arthritis. She's a beautiful, vital woman, very active, but I didn't know who would support her if I were unfairly incarcerated. Uh, and a, a number of uh, clerics, both African-American and, uh, and uh, evangelical Christian whites and others, including my own parish priest, had really urged me to embrace the Lord and put my problems in his hands. And I kept saying yes, and I would try to read the Proverbs and I would read some of the Psalms, but I, I just wasn't feeling it. And then a very young, dynamic, uh, young evangelist called named uh, Randy Coggins, whose dad was a pastor, whose grandfather was a pastor. He's a very dynamic uh, preacher. He sings, he dances, he really captures you. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, um, uh, Franklin Graham is gonna be in Boca Raton, Florida, very near where I live, and he's having a big revival. Would you like to go? And I said, yeah, I really would. He said, would you like to meet him if I can arrange a meeting? I, and I had seen Billy Graham preach when I was 12 years old. Yeah. I saw him at a tent revival for his crusade in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was, it's one of my earliest, clearest memories. He was really magnetic. He was yeah. really dynamic. And I said, sure, I kind of jumped at the chance. So uh, Reverend Graham was kind enough to give us about 20 private minutes. And I poured out my heart to him. I told him how I felt. And uh, he said, well, how can I help you? And I said, well, you're a good friend of the president. Uh, I'm, I'm prohibited from speaking to him. I haven't spoken to him in three years. Uh, maybe you put in a good word for me. He said, well, I'll see what I can do. But more importantly, there's a bigger answer to your problems. And I said, I'm listening. He said, look, you, you need to get right with Jesus Christ. You need to be reborn. You need to confess your sins. You need to pledge to sin no more, to walk in his way. And I guarantee you, if you will do that, I promise you, God will protect you. God will not abandon you. And God will deliver you from those who persecute you. And I thought mm -hmm. about it. And then I went to the revival. And he's a powerful speaker. He's not his father. He's a different style, yeah. but that's not to take anything away from him. He's very dynamic. Yes, he is. And he got to the point in his oration where he said, I don't care what your problem is, whether it's alcoholism or drug abuse or family problems or health problems or, fa or, 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 or financial problems. God will help you. God will protect you. God will not abandon you, but you need to, to cleanse your soul. You need to get right with God. So those who want to be saved, stand up now and repeat after me. And I felt that calling, I felt it in that mm. moment. Mm. And I stood up with 400 other Christians in an open field in Boca Raton and I took the pledge. And Governor, I gotta tell you, it was like a cement block was lifted off my chest. Mm. I left there with a bounce in my step, with a new confidence that God would protect me, that God would give the president the guidance. I think he gives him every single day uh, and that this would all work out. And therefore, even though many of my friends and family were worried at the end, I had lost all worry. It was out of my hands. It was now in the protective hands of God. The hardest part about this, the Bible teaches us that we must pray for those who trespass against us. Uh, you know, I'm half Sicilian, so revenge is kind of in my blood. <laughs> but <clears throat> I, I I'm have- I'm glad you warned us of that, Roger. Thank you. But I have been directed to Hebrews uh, uh, 30, pardon me, 10, 30, 31, which says vengeance is reserved for God. And therefore, those who have really, who I believe are evil, Weissman, Mueller, uh, Schiff, and company, God will deal with them. I, it's not my problem. I have to worry about it. God, They will face God's vengeance, and the vengeance of a living God is a fearful thing. Yes, it is. So I'm at peace, uh, mm. and now I'm going to clear my name and do everything I possibly can to reelect probably the greatest president of my lifetime, and that's tough to say. Roger Stone, we love having you here. This audience appreciates you. And uh, your candor and your uh, forthright just testimony is powerful. Thank you so very much. I'm gonna ask Keith Bilbrey to tell our viewers how they can keep up with Roger Stone, if it is possible to keep up with Roger Stone, because he's kind of hard to keep up with, but it would be worth your time. Keith?
I sure will. You can get all of Roger's books, including Stone's Rules, How to Win at Politics, Business, and Style, anywhere books are sold. 